Good evening. This is Sleep Chamber. My own podcast meant to put you to sleep. My name is Henrik and I'm not from around where you live probably. If you want, you can take a wild guess of where I'm from, but it doesn't matter really. My accent is not the important thing here. My voice is really just a tool for you to use. You don't have to listen to my words, but you can if you want. I won't tell you to relax or to visualize meadows or butterflies or that you're on a beach somewhere. I'm just going to talk. And you can use my voice either way you see fit. This kind of sleep method is a great one because it's easy to follow and it doesn't require any special engagement on your part. All you need to do is try and find a comfortable place within you and on the outside and just use my voice to drift away. It is what it is. What happens, happens. And as for now, there is nothing we can do. I had the most amazing dream last night. I found myself in a beautiful, magical place that I had never seen before. It was like something out of a fairy tale. There was a sparkling river running through the middle of the forest, and the trees were so tall that they reached up to the sky. The sun was shining and the birds were singing. I felt so happy and free. I was walking along the river when I saw a funny-looking, kind dragon. He was so friendly and he helped me solve my relationship problems. We talked for hours about everything and he gave me some great advice. I felt like I had finally found someone who understood me. The dragon was so wise and he helped me see things in a new light. I was finally able to let go of my past and move on with my life. I felt lighter and happier than I had in a long time. When I woke up, I felt like I had really been to a magical place and that I had made a new friend. I was so happy that I could barely contain myself. Let me tell you about another dream I had. I woke to the most beautiful sight I had ever seen. A land of rolling hills, pristine forests and glittering rivers. And in the distance, a towering castle made of white marble. I walked towards the castle, and as I got closer, I saw a figure standing on the steps leading up to the front door. He was an old man with a long white beard and piercing blue eyes. He beckoned me closer, and I walked up to him. Welcome, my son, he said. I'm the wizard of this land, and I have a quest for you. I was intrigued and asked him what the quest was. There is a lost treasure in this land, he said. And I need you to find it. I asked him where I should start looking, and he told me to begin in the forest to the east. 
I set off on my quest, and as I walked, I felt a sense of excitement and adventure. I had never been on a quest before, and I was determined to find the lost treasure. I searched the forest for hours, but I couldn't find any clues as to where the treasure might be hidden. I was about to give up when I heard a rustling in the bushes. I turned around, and to my surprise, I saw a fairy. She was small and delicate, with wings that sparkled in the sunlight. Hello, I said, do you know anything about the lost treasure? Oh, yes, she said. I know exactly where it is. She told me that the treasure was hidden in a cave on the other side of the forest. She gave me directions, and I set off again. After a few hours of walking, I came to the cave. It was dark and foreboding, and I hesitated for a moment before entering. But I knew I had to find the treasure, so I took a deep breath and went inside. It was pitch black inside the cave, and I had to feel my way along the walls. I was starting to get scared, and I was about to turn back when I heard a noise. It sounded like someone was crying. I followed the noise, and it led me to a small chamber. And there, in the chamber, I found the lost treasure. It was a small chest filled with gold and jewels. But more importantly, it was filled with happiness and love. I took the chest and walked back out of the cave. The wizard was waiting for me outside. Well done, my son, he said. You have found the lost treasure. And then I woke up. It was just another day. I woke up, got out of bed, and started my day like any other day. I went to the kitchen, made myself some breakfast, and then sat down to watch TV. I was flipping through the channels, trying to find something interesting to watch, when I came across a show about a man who had a very funny day. I decided to watch it. The man on the show was having a great time. He was laughing and joking around with everyone he came across. It was clear that he was enjoying himself immensely. I found myself laughing along with him at his antics. I was having a great time just watching him. Eventually, the show ended and I went about my day. I went to work, ran some errands, and then came home. I was about to go to bed when I realized that I had forgotten to watch the show about the man with the funny day. I decided to watch it before I went to sleep. I laughed all the way through the show. It was just as funny as I remembered. It was a dark and stormy night. I was sitting in my chair, reading a book, when I heard a knock at the door. 
I got up to answer it, and there was a man standing there, soaking wet and shivering. I asked him what he was doing there, and he said he was lost and needed help. I told him to come in and warm up, and I would see if I could help him. I got him a towel and a cup of coffee, and he started to warm up. He told me his name was John, and he was on his way home from work when he got lost. He said he had been walking for hours, and he was exhausted. I told him I would try to help him, but I didn't know where he lived. He showed me a picture of his house, and I recognized it. I told him I would take him there, but he said he didn't want to trouble me. I insisted, and he finally agreed. I got my coat and umbrella, and we went out into the storm. The wind was howling and the rain was coming down in sheets. I could barely see where I was going, but I managed to get us to his house. I knocked on the door, and his wife answered. She was surprised to see me, but I told her I had found her husband and brought him home. She was very grateful, and they invited me in for a cup of coffee. We sat and talked for a while, and I found out that John and his wife had been having some problems. She said he had been working a lot and she felt like he was never home. John said he was sorry and he would try to do better. I left them to talk, and I went home. It was a weird evening, but I was glad I could help John. When I got back home I got going with my nightly routine. I'm a creature of habit. I like my routines and I like things to be just so. That's why, every night before I go to bed, I follow the same routine. It helps me to wind down and relax, and it ensures that I get a good night's sleep. First, I brush my teeth and wash my face. I take my time with this, making sure to remove all traces of dirt pee and to really scrub my skin. I don't want to go to bed with a dirty face. Next, I change into my pajamas. I always make sure to put on a clean pair of pajamas, even if I've just taken a shower. There's something about getting into clean bedding that makes me feel refreshed and ready for sleep. Then, I climb into bed and get cozy. I like to take a few minutes to just relax in bed, letting my body sink into the mattress and letting my mind wander. I might read a bit or scroll through my phone, but I try to avoid looking at any screens for too long. I don't want the light to keep me awake. Finally, I close my eyes and drift off to sleep. If I can't sleep, I count sheep. The other night I had a different nightly experience though. It was another long day. I was exhausted from work and just wanted to relax and fall asleep. I got into bed and tried to clear my mind, but my mind was racing and I couldn't seem to calm down. 
I tried counting sheep, but that didn't work. I tried focusing on my breath, but that just made me more aware of how fast my heart was beating. I was starting to get frustrated. I didn't want to spend another night tossing and turning, trying to fall asleep. I got out of bed and decided to take a walk. I needed to clear my head and maybe get some fresh air. I put on my shoes and went outside. I walked around the block a few times, taking in the sights and sounds of the night. I felt a little better after my walk, but I still wasn't sleepy. I decided to try something else. I went into the kitchen and made myself a cup of herbal tea. I added a little honey and lemon to it. I sat down at the table and sipped my tea. I felt my body starting to relax. The warm tea and the soothing herbs were just what I needed. I finished my tea and went back to bed. I was finally able to fall asleep and I had the best night's sleep in a long time. This is actually a good segue to our next segment. I have a guest in the studio today. Let me introduce Arbery Sleeper, a professor in sleep patterns. Welcome, Arbery. Thank you. So, Arbery, how did you become interested in sleep patterns? Well, it actually started when I was in college. I was taking a biology class, and we were studying the brain. And I just found it fascinating how this organ controls everything we do. And then, when we started talking about sleep, I just became really interested in it. I started reading everything I could about it, and I just became really fascinated by it. So, what did you do after college? I actually went to graduate school for a while, and I studied neuroscience. And I just became more and more interested in sleep, and how it affects the brain. And I started doing research on it, and I just became really passionate about it. So, you're a sleep researcher now? Yes, I am. I've been doing it for about 10 years now. So, what are some of the things you've learned about sleep? Well, I've learned a lot about how sleep affects the brain. I've also learned a lot about sleep disorders and how to treat them. I've also learned a lot about how to improve sleep and how to get a good night's sleep. So, what are some of the things that people can do to improve their sleep? Well, there are a few things. First of all, people need to make sure that they're getting enough sleep. People need to get at least seven hours of sleep every night. People also need to make sure that they're sleeping in a dark, quiet, and cool environment. 
and people also need to make sure that they're not using any electronic devices before they go to bed. So, what are some of the things that people can do to get a good night's sleep? Well, there are a few things. First of all, people need to make sure that they're getting enough sleep. People need to get at least seven hours of sleep every night. People also need to make sure that they're sleeping in a dark, quiet, and cool environment. And people also need to make sure that they're not using any electronic devices before they go to bed. So, what are some of the things that people can do to treat sleep disorders? Well, there are a few things. First of all, people need to make sure that they're getting enough sleep. People need to get at least seven hours of sleep every night. People also need to make sure that they're sleeping in a dark, quiet, and cool environment. And people also need to make sure that they're not using any electronic devices before they go to bed. Wow, that's a lot of things to keep in mind. I know that I personally have a hard time getting enough sleep. Do you have any tips on how to get better sleep? Yes, definitely. One of the best things people can do is to establish a regular sleep schedule. That means going to bed and waking up at the same time every day, even on weekends. People should also avoid caffeine and alcohol before bed, and should avoid working or using electronic devices in bed. Creating a relaxing bedtime routine can also help people fall asleep more easily. That makes sense. I know that I definitely need to work on establishing a regular sleep schedule. I'm also going to try to avoid working in bed from now on. Do you have any other advice? Yes. People should try to get at least 30 minutes of exercise every day. Exercise can help improve sleep quality. People should also avoid eating large meals before bed and should avoid drinking too much fluid before bed so that they don't have to wake up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom. All right, I'll definitely try to incorporate some of these tips into my life. I think that getting better sleep will definitely help me feel better overall. Thank you so much for your time, Arvory. That was very informative and interesting. We actually have one more guest. Welcome to the studio, Larry Cowbell. So, Larry, tell me a little about your work with peanuts and pigs. Well, I've been working with peanuts and pigs for about 20 years now. I started out as a research assistant at a university and then I became a professor at a small college. What made you decide to work with these two subjects? I've always been interested in animals, and I thought it would be a great way to help farmers. Peanuts and pigs are two of the most important things in the world, 
and I wanted to help farmers produce them more efficiently. What are some of the challenges you face when working with this? One of the biggest challenges is getting the pigs to eat the peanuts. They usually don't like the taste, so we have to find ways to make them more palatable. Another challenge is dealing with the waste. Pigs produce a lot of manure, and it can be difficult to manage. What are some of the benefits of working with pigs and peanuts? One of the best things about working with pigs is that they're very intelligent animals. They're also very social, so they're great to work with. Peanuts are a great crop because they're very versatile. They can be used for food, oil, and even animal feed. What do you see as the future of your work with these animals? I think the future is very bright for both peanuts and pigs. I think we'll continue to see more research and development in both areas, and that farmers will continue to benefit from our work. That's great to hear. What do you think are the most promising areas of research for each? For peanuts, I think we'll continue to see progress in developing new varieties that are more resistant to disease and pests. For pigs, I think we'll see more progress in improving reproductive efficiency and reducing the incidence of disease. That sounds like very exciting work. What do you think are the biggest challenges facing farmers today? I think the biggest challenge facing farmers today is the increasing cost of inputs, such as seed, fertilizer, and fuel. I think we'll continue to see consolidation in the industry as larger farms get bigger and smaller farms go out of business. That's a very interesting perspective. Thank you so much for your time, Larry. Thank you for letting me share. Wow, who would have thought that peanuts and pigs could be so versatile? Pigs are interesting animals. Pigs are farmyard animals that are often considered to be dirty and smelly. However, there are many benefits to surrounding yourself with these creatures. Pigs are intelligent and social animals that can provide companionship and emotional support. And their manure can be used as an effective fertilizer. Pigs are intelligent animals that are able to learn and remember complex tasks. They are also very social creatures and form strong bonds with other pigs. Pigs can provide companionship and emotional support and can even be trained to perform tricks. Pigs are also very clean animals. They have no sweat glands, so they do not produce body odor. There are many benefits to surrounding yourself with pigs. These creatures are intelligent and social, and can provide companionship and emotional support. Peanuts are a type of legume that is native to South America. They are a popular food all over the world and are used in many different dishes. Peanuts are high in protein and fiber and are a good source of vitamins and minerals. 
There are many different ways to enjoy peanuts. They can be eaten raw, roasted, or boiled. Peanuts can also be used in baking or to make peanut butter. Peanut butter is a popular spread for toast and sandwiches. Peanuts are also used in many Asian dishes such as satay and pad thai. Peanuts are a nutritious food that can be enjoyed in many different ways. They are a good source of protein, fiber, and vitamins and minerals. Peanuts are a versatile food that can be used in many different dishes. So, the next time you are looking for a snack, reach for a handful of peanuts. Or, if you are feeling adventurous, try using peanuts in a new dish. However you eat them, peanuts are a delicious and nutritious food that are sure to please. Maybe I should be a professor in pigs and peanuts. Clearly I know a lot of things about peanuts. And about pigs. I'm still thinking about writing a book. The what would I write about? One could write about their favorite hobby. Their favorite place. Their favorite thing to do. Or anything else that they can think of. No matter what the subject is. There are always going to be things to write about. For example, if someone were to write about their favorite hobby, they could talk about why they enjoy it, what they like to do while they are doing it, and how it makes them feel. They could also talk about how it has helped them in their life, or how it has made them a better person. No matter what the subject is, there are always going to be things to write about. If someone were to write about their favorite place, they could talk about the sights, the sounds, the smells, and the people. They could talk about how it makes them feel, and why they enjoy spending time there. They could also talk about how it has helped them in their life, or how it has made them a better person. No matter what the subject is, there are always going to be things to write about. If someone were to write about their favorite thing to do, they could talk about why they enjoy it, what they like to do while they are doing it, and how it makes them feel. They could also talk about how it has helped them in their life, or how it has made them a better person. No matter what the subject is, there are always going to be things to write about. No matter what the subject is, there are always going to be things to write about. This is because everyone has different experiences, thoughts, and feelings about things. What one person may think is boring, another person may find interesting. What one person may think is beautiful, another person may find ugly. This is what makes us all unique and special. Subjectivity and objectivity are two concepts that are often used in tandem, but what exactly do they mean? And how do they relate to one another? Subjectivity refers to a person's individual perspective, feelings, or opinions. In other words, it is the way that someone experiences the world. 
Objectivity, on the other hand, is the quality of being unbiased and not influenced by personal feelings or opinions. It is based on facts and evidence. The two concepts are not mutually exclusive. It is possible to have a subjective opinion that is based on objective facts. However, it is also possible to have a subjective opinion that is not based on any facts or evidence and is therefore not objective. The line between subjectivity and objectivity is often blurred and it can be difficult to determine whether something is one or the other. However, it is important to be aware of the distinction between the two, as they have very different implications. Subjectivity is often seen as being less reliable than objectivity, as it is based on personal opinion rather than facts. However, this is not always the case. Subjective opinions can be just as valid as objective ones, and in some cases, they may even be more accurate. This is because our individual experiences and perspectives can give us insights that objective facts cannot. Objectivity is often seen as the gold standard, but it is not always possible to achieve. In many cases, Objectivity is simply not possible, and we have to rely on subjective opinions. This is because there are some things that cannot be measured or quantified, and therefore cannot be objectively known. It is important to remember that both subjectivity and objectivity are important, and each has its own strengths and weaknesses. In many cases, the best course of action is to use both subjectivity and objectivity to get a well-rounded understanding of a situation. Have you ever heard about Arthur? Arthur had always been a firm believer in the power of subjectivity. To him, the ability to see the world from different perspectives was what made us human. It was what allowed us to empathize with others and to understand the complexities of the world around us. Arthur was always intrigued by the way that different people saw the world. He would often have long conversations with friends and family about their views on different topics. He was always open to hearing other people's opinions, even if they differed from his own. Arthur believed that subjectivity was what made us unique and special. It was what allowed us to connect with others on a deeper level. Without it, we would be nothing more than robots. Arthur was always willing to help others see the world from his perspective. He would often offer his help to those who were struggling to understand a certain concept. He believed that everyone had the right to their own opinion, but that it was important to be open to other viewpoints. Arthur was a strong advocate for the power of subjectivity. He believed that it was what made us human and that it was essential for a healthy society. Mira, however, she was more into objectivity. Mira had always been a firm believer in objectivity. It was one of the core values that she lived by. To her, it meant that she always strived to see both sides of every issue and to make her decisions based on what was fair and just, rather than on her own personal biases. This was why she had always been such a successful lawyer. She was able to see both sides of every argument and to make decisions based on the evidence rather than on emotion. 
However, there were some things in life that Mira found it difficult to be objective about. One of these was her relationship with her husband, Alex. Mira loved Alex deeply and she knew that he loved her too. However, there were times when she couldn't help but feel that he was being a little too controlling. He always wanted to know where she was and what she was doing, and he would get angry if she didn't answer his calls immediately. Mera knew that this was partly due to his own insecurity and insecurity, but it still made her feel suffocated at times. Another area where Mira found it difficult to be objective was in her work. As a lawyer, she was often required to defend clients who she knew were guilty. It went against everything she believed in, but she had to do her job. She would often lie awake at night, wondering how she could live with herself after helping someone to get away with a crime. Despite these challenges, Mira still strived to live her life as objectively as possible. She knew that it was the only way to ensure that she was making the right decisions, both for herself and for those around her. I often think about Arthur and Mira. Objectivity had always been important to Mira. As a lawyer, she needed to be able to see both sides of every issue and make a judgment based on the facts. This made her very successful. However, she met a man called Arthur who was a strong advocate for subjectivity. He believed that everyone saw the world through their own individual lens and that there was no such thing as true objectivity. Mira was intrigued by his point of view and the two of them would often debate about the merits of each approach. Over time, Mira started to see the world differently. She began to see that her objectivity was sometimes blinding her to the true nature of things. Arthur helped her to see that sometimes the best way to understand something was to feel it, rather than just think about it. Eventually, Mira came to see the value in both approaches. Objectivity was important for making sure that she didn't miss any important details, but subjectivity was also important for understanding the emotional side of things. She realized that the two approaches could actually complement each other. Mira and Arthur remain good friends to this day, and they continue to debate about the merits of objectivity and subjectivity. But now, Mira is able to see both sides of every issue and make a judgment based on the facts and her own personal feelings. One day, a bird who was studying subjectivity at the University of Flu in Florence decided to take a break from her studies. She flew out of the window of her loft apartment and into the city below. The bird was amazed by all the sights and sounds of the city, and she felt like she was seeing and experiencing everything for the first time. She flew from one end of the city to the other, taking in all the sights and sounds. As she was flying, the bird noticed a group of people gathered around a man who was shouting. The bird flew closer to see what was going on. The man was shouting about how the government was corrupt. The bird was surprised by the man's vehemence and decided to listen to him for a while. The bird continued to fly around the city and she started to notice that there were a lot of unhappy people. 
she saw people fighting, crying, and shouting. She also saw a lot of people who were just walking around with blank expressions on their faces. The bird started to feel like she was seeing the world in a new way. She realized that she had been so focused on her studies that she had never really taken the time to notice the world around her. The bird flew back to her apartment and sat at the window, looking out at the city. She thought about what she had seen and heard. She realized that the world was full of subjectivity and that everyone experiences the world in their own way. She also realized that she was just one small part of the world and that there was so much more to learn. The bird went back to her studies with a new perspective and she was determined to learn more about the world and the people in it. She wanted to understand why people were unhappy, and she wanted to find ways to make the world a better place. The bird continued to fly around the city, and she started to make a difference in the lives of the people she met. The elephant had always been interested in objectivity. It was something that had fascinated her from a young age. She had always been a bit of a thinker, and she was always looking for ways to improve her understanding of the world. When she heard about the College of Crayon in Colorado, she knew that it was the perfect place for her to continue her studies. The College of Crayon was a small, private college that was known for its rigorous academic program. The elephant was excited to be able to study under some of the best minds in the field of objectivity. She was eager to learn all that she could about the topic. During her time at the College of Crayon, the elephant made some great friends. She also met her future husband, an elephant named Trunk. Trunk was also studying objectivity at the College of Crayon, and the two of them bonded over their shared love of learning. After graduation, the elephant and Trunk got married and moved to Africa. They started a family and the elephant continued her studies of objectivity. She became a well-respected authority on the topic, and she even wrote a book about it. The elephant's life was a happy one, and she was contented with her lot in life. She was proud of her achievements and loved her family dearly. She knew that she had made the right choice in studying objectivity, and she was glad that she had been able to find her passion in life. I had the most amazing dream last night. I was floating on a cloud, high above the ground, surrounded by the most beautiful blue sky. The sun was shining and the breeze was blowing through my hair. I felt so free and happy, like I could float forever. Suddenly, I started to descend towards the ground, and I landed in the most beautiful garden I had ever seen. The flowers were blooming and the trees were swaying in the breeze. I felt so happy and content, like I could just stay there forever. I started to wander around the garden, admiring the beauty all around me. Then, I saw the most amazing sight. The waterfall cascading down a cliff into a crystal clear pool. 
I walked over to the edge of the pool and dipped my toes in. The water was so cold and refreshing. I sat down by the edge of the pool and just stared at the waterfall, letting the peacefulness wash over me. What does it mean to be happy and content? To be happy is to experience positive emotions, such as joy, love, satisfaction, and relief. Contentment, on the other hand, is a state of feeling satisfied or fulfilled. It is often described as a sense of calm happiness or peaceful satisfaction. So, how can we achieve happiness and contentment in our lives? There is no one-size-fits-all answer, as what works for one person may not work for another. However, there are some general tips that can help. One way to boost your happiness levels is to connect with others. This could involve spending time with friends and family, volunteering, or simply engaging in conversations with strangers. Social interactions can help us feel more connected and supported, which can in turn lead to increased happiness. It's also important to take care of yourself physically. Exercise releases endorphins, which have mood-boosting effects. Eating a healthy diet and getting enough sleep are also crucial for maintaining a good emotional state. In addition, it's helpful to focus on the positive aspects of your life. This could involve practicing gratitude, savoring positive experiences, and setting personal goals. By doing so, you'll be more likely to see the glass as half full rather than half empty. Finally, remember that happiness and contentment are not about acquiring material possessions. Instead, they are about finding joy in the simple things in life and being grateful for what you have. So, start by taking small steps to improve your happiness and contentment levels. Over time, you may just find that you're living a more fulfilling and joyful life. Most of us have experienced dreams. Those nightly visions that occur during sleep. Dreams can be baffling, entertaining, enlightening and sometimes even disturbing. Although we may not always remember our dreams, it is estimated that we dream for around two hours each night. So what exactly is dreaming and what purpose does it serve? Dreaming is a normal part of sleep. It is a time when our brain is active and we are able to process information and consolidate memories. Dreams occur during the rapid eye movement stage of sleep. This is when we are most likely to have vivid and memorable dreams. During REM sleep, our brain waves are similar to those we experience when we are awake. Our eyes move rapidly from side to side and our breathing and heart rate also increase. It is thought that dreaming helps to process and store information in our long-term memory. Some researchers believe that dreams may also help us to solve problems. When we dream, we are more likely to think creatively and outside the box. This can lead to new insights and solutions that we may not have thought of when we are awake. So, what causes dreams? 
It is not entirely clear what causes dreams, but they are thought to be linked to our memories and experiences. Dreams may also be a way for our brain to process and make sense of the events of the day. It is thought that dreams are most likely to occur during the REM stage of sleep. This is when our brain waves are most similar to those we experience when we are awake. Some researchers believe that dreams may be a way for our brain to process and make sense of the events of the day. Dreams may also be linked to our memories and experiences. It is not entirely clear what causes dreams, but they are thought to be linked to our memories and experiences. Dreams may also be a way for our brain to process and make sense of the events of the day. The average person spends one-third of their life asleep. Despite its importance, sleep is still one of the most mysterious and least understood aspects of human biology. Why do we sleep? What are the consequences of not getting enough sleep? How does sleep affect our health? There is no one answer to these questions. Sleep is a complex biological process that is still not fully understood. However, there are some theories that can help to explain why we sleep and what happens when we don't get enough of it. One theory is that sleep is a way for our bodies to rest and repair. When we are awake, our bodies are constantly using energy. This can lead to wear and tear on our cells and tissues. Sleep gives our bodies a chance to rest and repair these damaged cells. Another theory is that sleep helps to consolidate our memories. When we are awake, we are constantly taking in new information. This information is stored in our short-term memory. However, this information can quickly be forgotten if it is not transferred to our long-term memory. Sleep gives our brains a chance to consolidate these memories so that they can be stored for later use. Not getting enough sleep can have serious consequences. Sleep deprivation can lead to problems with mood, concentration, and energy levels. It can also increase the risk of accidents and errors. In the long term, sleep deprivation can lead to chronic health problems such as obesity, heart disease, and diabetes. There are many different factors that can affect our sleep patterns. Age, stress, diet, and exercise all play a role in how well we sleep. For example, older adults tend to sleep less than young adults. This is because the sleep needs change as we age. Stress can also affect our sleep. When we are stressed, our bodies are in a state of fight or flight which can make it difficult to fall asleep. There are also many different sleep disorders that can disrupt our sleep patterns. Insomnia, sleep apnea, and narcolepsy are just a few of the most common sleep disorders. These disorders can be caused by a variety of factors such as medical conditions, medications, and lifestyle choices. Sleep is a vital part of our overall health and well-being. 
it is important to make sure that we are getting enough sleep every night. This means that we should avoid things that can disrupt our sleep such as stress, caffeine, and alcohol. We should also try to create a sleep-friendly environment in our bedrooms by making sure that the temperature is cool and the bed is comfortable. There is no doubt that experiencing new things is one of the most, if not the most, important aspects of life. It is what helps us to grow and learn as individuals, and it is what makes life interesting and exciting. Think about it. If we never experienced anything new, we would all be stuck in the same routine day in and day out. We would never learn anything new and we would never have any new challenges to face. Life would be incredibly boring. Experiencing new things helps us to grow as individuals. Every time we try something new, we are pushing ourselves outside of our comfort zone and expanding our horizons. We learn more about who we are and what we are capable of. We might even surprise ourselves with what we are able to achieve. It is not just about learning new things, but also about opening our minds to new ideas and new ways of thinking. When we experience something new, we are exposed to new perspectives and we can learn to see things in a different light. This can be incredibly eye-opening and can help us to become more tolerant and understanding of others. Of course, experiencing new things also helps to keep life interesting and exciting. There is nothing worse than feeling like life is just one big monotonous grind. Experiencing new things can help to break up the monotony and add some spice back into our lives. So, next time you are thinking about doing something new, go for it. You never know what you might learn about yourself or the world around you.